Okay. So again, welcome to the eighth class in the Collapse of Complex Societies uh, course at the School for Advanced Studies at the University of Tumen in Russia. Um, I wanna welcome everybody who might be streaming from anywhere else in the world. And of course, uh, we have most of our students here. I think we're missing one person. And uh, today we're gonna talk, uh, continue our discussion on some of the theories of collapse, looking at some of the structural elements of collapse, um, the types of stress that, that go into a complex society that can lead to a, a process of degradation. And, and uh, I, I think that's as far as we'll get today. Uh, starting next week, we'll actually start talking about some case studies of collapse. So let me get uh, the slides up here. Okay, are we good? You can see? All right. I'm trying to get you guys set up here as well so I can see you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just a reminder that one week from today, Eric Klein will be on with us, uh, coming from the East Coast in America, uh, and he'll be talking about the, the collapse of the late Bronze Age. So I've assigned his lecture, uh, which is on YouTube, uh, and you have that in, in Canvas and our, our um, course maintenance uh, software. Um, so that's a requirement for you to watch that lecture and to write up questions on the lecture before Thursday, right? Submit those. Uh, and let's, he wants to, to run it as a dialogue. And so this is a chance to really tap into the mind of one of the foremost scientists that, who works in classical and biblical archaeology. So questions about the Exodus, questions about the relationship between Egypt and the Hittites, or the the you know the Mycenaeans, the Greeks of, of Troy, you know, of, of the legends of Jason the Argonauts, Odysseus, you know these are all intertwined. Of the relationship of cuneiform, of you know of climatic changes and technological changes as you move from the Bronze Age towards the Iron Age, in in the Eastern Mediterranean. All these things are all in play. All have had elements of them put into the theory of the collapse of civilizations. And so Eric is one of the you know, foremost experts on the topic. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him as a lecturer. Um, so I, I imagine he'll give some basic introductory notes and a little bit of discussion um, before he opens it up. And then the, you know, the whole time will be time for dialogue. So any questions you have about collapse, and, and, and he does a lot of cross-cultural analysis and looking at, at contemporary society as well. So any of these dynamics, as well as the specific things about collapse in the Eastern Mediterranean, this is a great opportunity to, to talk to him, and you, you all need to make sure you take good advantage of that. Okay, other schedules that we have coming up. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll talk about the, uh, the Romano British and the Aztecs, and we should make it to that. Um, Thursday, of course, we have Eric. Uh, uh, the following Tuesday, Dennis, our own uh, archaeologist here, who's here on a full break, uh, who's been doing some fascinating work in the, with complex societies in the Southern Urals. Um, and he's teaching an archaeology course, also this term, uh, which you may be aware of. Uh, on, the 28th, we have the head archaeologist from the National Geographic magazine. who will be talking about his work on the Eurasian steppe. And he's done a lot of work in Russia and Afghanistan. Um, June 2nd, we have uh, uh, Guillermo de Anda, who will be talking about water worship and the collapse of the Maya, does underwater archaeology in these, in these caves. Um, just fascinating work also 
has been been well published on TV and in um, um, uh, popular magazines like National Geographic. And then um, uh, June 4th, I think we'll, we'll continue on the Maya and I'll talk about the Maya lowlands. He'll be for, focusing more on the Yucatan area, which has a different geology and a different um, climatic regimen in part. There's, there's some similarities. Culturally, they're very similar, but the, the limestone where you have these underground caves where he's working is much newer than in the lowlands. And, and it makes a big difference on the hydrology and the hydrology, you know, the, the relationship to the environment and the relationship with water becomes very different when, when you've got this, this big geological difference. And so I think it's important to take a look and contrast these two sub areas of the Maya region, looking at the lowlands in Guatemala uh, versus the Yucatan in, in Mexico. And then the last week is going to be your week. Um, this is when you're going to have the chance to present, just like Eric will do, where you'll present your topic. And you, you'll have the full hour and a half, I decided to give you the whole time, so that you each have time to talk about uh, elements of the, the um, what you've been researching. And then there will also be uh, extended time for questions and answers and for discussion about what led to the collapse of that society based on your research and, and the input that we have from other people. And this will be open to the public also. We'll stream you out on YouTube also in case people are watching and want to ask questions uh, and contribute that, that all your lectures will be open. So I've, I've rolled our seminars and our group work into this so that we can have time for each of you to be able to, each group to be able to present. So we'll start just in the numeric order that we, we already sorted out in our uh, other classes with the Khmer on June 5th, uh, Easter Island on June 8th, uh, Xiao Dynasty on the 9th, uh, the 10th will be the Songhai, and on the 13th, the last day of the term, um, the Persians, last but not least. All right. If there's any issues, we can we can adjust the schedule a little bit, but I'd like to stick with this as uh, as long as it works. We can make it work with all you guys. Questions? All right. So we left off. We I think we just gotten into talking a little bit about Joseph Tainter's work, and this is probably one of the most cited works when it comes to the collapse of civilizations. And so so I, I think of it in terms of entropy, that, that systems tend to become less efficient. They move more towards chaos. And it takes energy to hold that system together. So there has to be a real effort to it, or things will want to become dispersed. We, you know, we're, we're in stress now as we are isolated. And we have to make an effort to keep the class is going, right? We have to develop our, our uh, internet capabilities. We have to make sure we have the infrastructure for it. We have to adjust our teaching style and our learning style and, and everything else. And so, so it's taking an effort to recreate that order that was disrupted by the, by the coronavirus. Um, if you don't, you know, it's really easy. I think you probably all have this sensation to wake up in the morning and just forget even what day it is, you know, you have no sense of time, you know, um, you know, you don't, you have to remind yourself that you have class and things to do and, and homework because um, a lot of the structure that we're used to that's in place that helps us keep together and, and hold our society together has been disrupted and, and some of it taken away completely. So society needs those forces, those, those centripetal forces, right, to, to pull you back together against those kind of more natural chaotic forces at entropy, where, you know, we'll, we'll go to our family group, we'll go to our natural social groups, we'll go hang out and do the things that we like to do. And, and we won't invest that time to maintain the order that we want to maintain our civilization. So, you know, when we look at the economy, the, you know, the big threat that is felt particularly um, expressed in the United States, but, but uh, felt around the world, is that the economy is falling apart in those very same way, right? People aren't going to work. I just read an article that they're talking about killing 10,000 pigs because 
because they can't get them to market. And so they're just going to euthanize them and throw them away. Um, you know, so, so you see these things start to break down. Uh, and this then becomes, I, I, the way I interpret what Joseph Tainter is talking about, that this is kind of what we're up against. This is, there's a cost benefit going on all the time in society. Is it worth investing? in that civilization? Are we getting enough returns for that investment? Uh, so in, in, in his study, he looks at the Western Roman Empire and the classical uh, Maya civilization and then the Chacoan uh, society. And so he's looking at these very big systemic processes. Now he puts forward a theory of postulates and I think I'm gonna let you guys read these postulates. And let me call on, I can't remember. Dennis, are you there? Dennis? Oh. Uh, Ekaterina? Yeah, I'm here. Um, human societies are problem solving organizations uh, that generate benefits for their members and uh, in order to develop and sustain themselves, they must continue to solve problems and generate benefits. Okay, so what's he saying there? Or maybe it's straightforward enough that there's not much in question. Someone, someone paraphrase it for me. Give me a summary of what you think it means. Yeah, I think that this idea is similar to I, I, I unfortunately I don't uh, remember the name of the water, but uh, it is similar to the water uh, to, to the idea we read uh, in some text uh, that human nature um, has some uh, intentions to change um, environment, and so here we see that human societies are problem solving, so they they have this inten intention. And from that, uh, some actions are are going. Okay, so uh, um, maybe you're referring back to Durkheim with solidarity, or or maybe to Leslie White with the energetics. Yeah. So so yeah, and so there is, a, you know, and he uses the word energy, of course, in his, his text and writing as well. So so yeah, that um, you know societies we get together to solve problems. What type of problems is getting together? When we talked about the evolution of complex societies, what type of problems are we solving as a complex society? Yeah, for instance, we can uh, uh, talk about ecological problems and um, the issue of irrigation when you need to, to regulate agriculture. Or when we talk about uh, some units um, and um, outside forces, and you have to protect your society. Okay, sure. So protection is a big one. Um, subsistence. So we, we talked about hunter-gatherers, right, the, the, as we looked at different levels of complexity of, of human organization. When, as people organize themselves, it allows them two big advantages that I can see right off the bat. First is the stability of food, right? If you're able to produce it, you've got more control on it. You don't have to follow it around, um, you know, chase, chasing the game. Um, you know, you don't have to hunt and, and gather for it. You can put it right where you want it. You know, if you have fertile land, you can put it right there. So, so it mitigates the risk that might happen in, in, in instabilities in the environment. There's still instabilities, of course, even in, in agriculture, but you can mitigate those, especially when you use irrigation, right? The, the, these more intensive methods of agriculture. Um, so that's the other aspect is that it, it allows for intensification of production. It allows the creation of surplus, of extra, right? Hunter gatherers, you know, Neanderthals wandering around Europe, they didn't carry a lot of extra food with them, did they? They pretty much depended each day, you know, to, to get what they could get. Or if they have a camp, you know, that might last for a week or something like that. Um, so it allows you to build up surplus. And of course, we know that surplus is fundamental to the development of complexity because surplus means that you can have people involved in activities other than procuring food, that these people then can become more specialists in 
leadership, in military, in art, in science, in magic, in religion. So all these different specialties where people can reduce the amount of time that they put into procuring food and spend that time and energy into doing other things that, that are, are the building blocks of complex society and, and civilization. So that's his first postulate, that, that he has this variable B, right? That's the benefits of being part of a group, being part of a complex society. Um, Nikita, do you want to read this one? You there, Nikita? You mean read this, read this all? Yeah, please. Uh, like all organizations, human societies must capture and expand energy in order to sustain their problem-solving capacity. Classically, societies have captured energy by uh, foraging, farming, burning fossil fuels, and also through war, through war and imperial expansion. Okay, so uh, like Asya mentioned, that this does reflect back to the concept of energy that Leslie White talked about, right? Where he he looked just pure in, in energy terms, you know, that, that everything could be measured in energetics. Um, energy is essential, uh, but with Tainter, I think we're looking more at the management of energy and the management of people in, in regard to that energy. So, um, he, he, for this, he assigns the variable C, right, to, to expended energy. That's your cost. So when you, if B is your benefit, then C is your cost. So can someone give me an example of cost benefit in your life? Do you do cost benefit analysis? Well, to go to the class, you must First, need to remember about it, then to make some like action to turn Zoom on and like visit the class. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, at, at a very fundamental level, sure, it's the mechanics of getting on Zoom. At at a larger level, if you're a student and you're putting a lot of cost, a lot of energy, money, time into earning that degree because you envision a benefit at the end, right, with your education. And so, so, and society does the same thing, right? We want our young people to be educated because we think it will build a better society for the future. So society is making an investment. You don't produce food, right? Um, it, it's not, there's, we're, it's not something that we need to do. It's something that we see a benefit to doing for our society and for our culture. So we're willing to put that energy, put those resources in, pay me a salary, right? Um, have a building that no one can use with computers that no one can use right right now. Um, so we have the infrastructure for the university. Um, and so, so society is, is putting a cost into that and there's a benefit to it. Do you think there's a benefit to it? I mean, you are here. Uh, may? Yeah, uh, it could be a benefit if educated people will live in the country, will continue living in the country. But uh, it's not always the case. And sometimes, yeah, uh, brains are leaking, right? And so on. So sometimes the predictions uh, do not uh, occur. Uh, yeah, and, and certainly um, sometimes people who are too educated are seen as a threat to a country, right? When, when you look at uh, a lot of movements, you, when you see dictatorships or totalitarian dystopias develop, oftentimes they eliminate the teachers and, and the doctors and the philosophers and the educators, the people who might might start a protest, right? When, when Cambodia, you know, when the Khmer Rouge, different Khmer than you guys, right? <laughs> so when the Khmer Rouge, we're carrying the same name, Khmer for, for Cambodia, um, took control in the 1976 of Cambodia and they began their process of genocide in the killing fields of Cambodia. 
the first people to go were the teachers and the doctors and anyone educated who, who posed a threat to the regime. Uh, and, they, and they just cold-bloodedly, systematically murdered them, uh, well over a million people, as I recall. Um, I've actually done some excavations on some of the victims when I was working in Cambodia at one time. And, and they'd just been shot through the head or hit in the back of the head with an ax, uh, you know, with their hands tied behind their back, just cold-blooded murder. Um, but so they would eliminate anyone they wanted and, and the people who were targeted. When Mao had his cultural revolution in China, you know, the educated were re-educated or eliminated. Um, so, and when Stalin did purges in Russia, oftentimes it was scientists who were the victims or people, you know, who, who were in high positions in the military. Um, so, uh, when when Lysenko took over the you know, genetic engineer or genetic um, uh, sciences in Russia, appointed by Stalin, you know th this competition was 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 gotten out of the picture one way or another, um, so that he could put forward his genetic policies for Russian agriculture, which were were very bad. They weren't Darwinian, and and it led to uh, it held. Soviet um, progress in, in um, agricultural development back quite a bit during the, the 1950s. When the rest of the world was just capitalizing, really learning how to use Darwinian theory to its advantage to develop uh, more robust uh, grains. So, so yeah, so there's a cost and a benefit, but yeah, there are societies, but what happens to the societies who, who went after their educated class? The Khmer Rouge eventually collapsed. They were wiped out, you know, taken down by the Vietnamese who invaded to end the genocide. Um, Stalin's regime, you know, eventually went by the wayside and Russia, you know, began promoting much better science. Um, you know, the social, the, the cultural revolution in China, you know, certainly the Chinese continued, um, but um, as they're, entering now into as a, as a major global player in the world system they're they're emphasizing science and they're and they you know their um, university system and their their scientific personnel are now spreading throughout the world and interacting with western universities um so you've got you know they they, they move past that so there was the time where they were more involved in, in just sort of brutal force and now they're trying to become an economic and a, an intellectual powerhouse in the world. Um, so, so yeah. So countries see that that cost benefit analysis, and um, and you know they can make that decision that we don't want to invest in that cost. The, the cost we want to do is to keep those people from causing any political issues. So everything's intertwined into these larger um, the the web of fabric that holds a society together. Uh, all right, the third postulate, um, Anna Kleshnikov. Anna, can you read that one? Yeah, therefore, in order to sustain themselves, society face a basic cost-benefit equation. Uh, the benefits of increased energy expenditure on problem-solving capacity must, must exceed their costs. Okay, so it's just straightforward that B has to be greater than C to make it worthwhile. And particularly when you look at the long-term development of a society, if they're, they're going to keep investing in that, the society can make, you know, can change and adjust. But um, if it's in, it gets into a situation where that's reversed, we'll see as we go on to the next postulates. So number four, uh, Daria, how about you? Daria Kostanikova. Increased investment in social political complexity usually yields higher returns, but this usually comes at an increasing per capita cost so that at a certain point, the marginal benefits on increased investment are outweighed by the marginal costs. So, so what is he suggesting in this idea?
Is, are there limits to to what you can get out of a, a cost benefit relationship? Okay, Artem, your head's moving moving good there. Yeah, as I understood, it's just basically that we can grow our institutions and our hierarchy and our order uh, to increase our benefits, and it does increase our benefits until it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Um, so could you imagine a situation where you invested so many resources into education and, and, and you know, cause we can, how much knowledge is there? How long could you spend of your life learning? Uh, Asya, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to clarify whether I understood the idea right or not. Uh, I would like to provide an example. So I know that uh, um, Portuguese once uh, found a lot of silver and they grasped that all uh, there were a lot of ships, a lot of sailors and so on. And after uh, that, the, the volume of silver was so huge that it just lost its price. Yeah, that could be one way that it could manifest. So here's a, a place where where something is valuable, but if you make too much of it, then it loses value, right? There's no more market demand. You, you, you undercut your market. So we had a case back in the 1970s, was it, where two, two billionaire brothers from Texas, as I recall, the Hunt brothers, bought up all the silver in America that they could. And they, by hoarding it, then they drove the value of the silver up. So they just thought they'd just buy all the silver, all the silver, and then drive the value up by, by hoarding it. Uh, and then and then they could dump it back into the market. And so they're kind of using the reverse. Um, once they dump it back into the market, of course, it's all going to drop back down. So the people who bought it high because they see silver going up then would be tricked into buying it. And then it would it would go back down to, you know, to uh, a lower level. Um, you can see the same thing if you're investing in a silver mine, for instance, right? If you're doing a mining operation, you put a lot of money into that mining operation. Um, but what if suddenly there's, you know, the market's flooded? Well, like oil right now. What's what's up with oil? What's, what's the situation with oil in the world right now? As I understood, um, I read a couple of news articles, not the scholarly. But as I understood, the situation is that there is uh, no place to uh, put oil in. So uh, the like the demand on oil is, is dropped, and so the uh, volume is uh, yeah yeah. So so the price for a barrel of oil is negative, right? They'll pay you to take the oil because they don't know what to do with it. They have no place to store it. Um, so, and you know, and that, that started with the the you know the war, be, be, the price war between OPEC and Russia, um, and then you throw in the the coronavirus, where there's suddenly no one's using oil, and now there's a surplus in the market that that you know there's not enough storage capacity to handle what's being produced, and you can and some of these things like apparently it's hard to slow down your production that much. So you invest all this infrastructure into a presumption that this market is going to be sustainable and something happens and the market's not sustainable, your cost that you put into it, right? Your cost for your storage, your cost for your employees, your cost for your, your oil wells and your extraction. And you know, in America, they've been doing the shale extraction. So it's added a, a new dimension to oil production. Um, so you have all this investment, assuming a level of return for your product, and if that level of return isn't there, now your cost benefits are, are something you're going to have to weigh. So now they're going to have to make a decision cost benefit wise, right? Whether to try to find a way to sustain it, sustain their infrastructure uh, and, and get past the, the coronavirus and hope that the demand for oil then comes up again, or they're going to have to start dismantling their, their infrastructure and stop, you know, fire employees, close down wells, you know, uh, mothball tankers and refineries. You know, you're talking, you know, trillions of dollars of infrastructure that would have to be decommissioned. 
Um, and then if, if there was a demand again later, then they'd have to try and rebuild that infrastructure. So there, you know, that's an example of a cost benefit analysis that you you have to do. If you fail, is it is it very possible that oil companies will go out of business under these circumstances? That they invested so much and now they're not getting a return, right? So the cost benefits are, are out of whack, and and they could go bankrupt. Uh, the United States has been giving money to oil companies to keep them from going bankrupt. Not that they didn't have enough reserves if they wanted, but they prefer to get the money from the United States government. Um, so, you know, you can you can look at almost any industry right now and they're all facing the same sort of dilemma under this crisis. So manufacturing all over the world, retail sales, food production, everything is under a stress right now where where your your corporate decision makers are, are looking at this CB sort of relationship is the cost of maintaining my employees, maintaining my stores, or all these things, you know, worth the benefit that I might get down the road or not. If not, you know, if they if they if they choose wrong or simply the circumstances may already be you know upon them where where they have collapse of a of, you know of a store of an industry to the point where it could be the collapse of an economy, which is something that in some scenarios is being projected for next year, right? That we enter a depression, not unlike what we saw, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, so, uh, all right, go to the follow on here. And Sophia, do you wanna read this one? Sophia Fedorova. Okay, if marginal cost uh, more than marginal benefits at an increased rate, uh, rate societies will collapse, uh, experience a rapid and significant decline in social political complexity. Okay, so that IE of course just means Latin for that is, you know, um, so like here's an example or, or here's clarification. So um, experience a rapid and significant decline of sociopolitical complexity. So what we were talking about for an industry, if you apply it to a society, then you're looking at societal collapse. So again, you know, Tainter's model here is looking at this bigger picture. He's he's lumping the the larger process. If you if you grouped everything together for a complex society and then imagined it in this cost benefit relationship at a certain point that there could be um, a, a time where the society has entered into a path where it can no longer reap enough benefit to sustain itself. And that can be caused by various um, reasons, right? Multiple reasons that could range from decisions being made by leaders to environmental degradation, uh, to war, to all these other factors that, that could could be feeding into this larger equation of whether a society is going to collapse or not. So we just kind of look at it as a flow chart here. You can see P1 up here, the human societies is problem solving. Um, you know, the societies capture and expend energy uh, to sustain themselves. Society has to have a, a, a positive um, benefit flow. To, it has to be greater than cost. Uh, here you can kind of see just a you know, a, a point on a graph of a bell curve of, of cost versus benefit. You can reach, a, reach an optimal point if you go over that for whatever reason, whatever might throw your 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 benefit down, then you're going to end up on the other side of that bell curve. And, and how steep that bell curve is will, will tell you how steep that process of collapse will be. Um, so and here he just shows it out as if MC is greater than the marginal benefit, then you're entering into a potential collapse. Uh, I, I would say, well, if you look on a, a graph like this, so where you've got your benefit here and your and your cost, um, as you start to go down, this is this is that time period where you might have a chance to correct it, right? Where you can do your analysis. This is where having scientists and educated people involved 
um, who can look at the larger system and say, okay, you know, we've, we've got an issue and this is what's going on now. This is, you know, we're able to watch in a very dramatic sense, the decision-making going on at the governmental levels in dealing with this, the, the coronavirus. As people are trying to decide, how do I balance, you know, in America, they they pretty much come to the decision, you know what, we can afford 200,000 people dying if it'll help sustain the economy. And so they're doing a cost benefit analysis, you know, um, economically and politically for themselves. I don't know that they're doing it for the people of the country, which is might, you know, be is the purpose of the country its own entity or, or is part of that purpose to to help secure the life of the people who form the country in the first place. Uh, but there's a cost benefit analysis and, and clearly there is a, a strong faction in America and, and we see it in other places in the world. Um, I, I find it just much easier to get American news. One thing is American news seems to only talk about America and doesn't really look at the rest of the world. Um, so I use America a lot as ex example because that's where I have most of my data from. Uh, and, and I think it's got one of the most dramatic um, sort of um, dramas, human drama being played out on the stage with, with you know, the lives of tens of thousands of people at stake and, and the economy and, and poverty of millions of people uh, on the line. So, so yeah, so decision makers have to make this decision. If I do this, is it going to help sustain the economy and the country, you know, down the road here? Is it going to allow me to, to, you know, maybe take a little dip here, but then come back up on the other side? Or, is it going to be so precarious? Will there be such a popular backlash? Could it result in rebellion on the street? It already has to, to a small degree. Um, so can it result in dissolution of the federated states? Um, we've already seen, we talked about different factions of groups of states in America forming uh, their own alliances to try to, to um, deal with the crisis. So, so yeah, right here is where all, a lot of the most critical decision making happens. Um, if you make the wrong decisions or ineffective or the circumstances are simply overwhelming, like we talked about before or yesterday, you know, that you could end up into a, a very precipitous collapse and a very, a very sudden drop, right? It can happen in weeks or months, when you look at when Tunisia, the Arab Spring happened, you know, beginning in Tunisia, how did that start? Does anyone remember? Right, it started with a young man who lit himself on fire, burned himself to death because he was so insulted at how he'd been treated by the police and it led to an overthrow of the government. Um, and that then spread to other Arab nations. I was in Egypt when, when it hit Egypt. Uh, so, you know, these, these type of things can be, you can, you can have them building up for a long time and then there might be a trigger event that, that, that kind of awakens people to it and, and motivates them emotionally and for, for you know, um, survival reasons to, to try to change their nation and, and can stimulate revolution. Okay, questions on Tainter. Does it seem like a reasonable model? Uh, Jay, I wanted yes. to yes. ask, uh, so as a get, it's not uh, every time when we can... Well, you're, you're muted, Daria. Sorry, 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 just a uh, problem with connection. So it's uh, not always uh, it's not like a doom of every society to be collapsed or there is a possibility for some uh, society, complex society to, you know, like a, have internal existence if it's, uh, you know, like a, make some decisions and uh, analyze its problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but because we're humans, that we, we have a lot of free will and how we, we decide and work things out. We can design a sustainable world 
I mean, eventually it will collapse, right? Because the sun will supernova or we might collide with another uh, astral body or something like that. Um, but we're talking for the sun to supernova, what is it, 40 billion years or something? Um, or when it swells up enough to swallow the earth into a red giant. So, um, so I mean, things are finite in the universe, right? Our lives are finite and the, the lifespan of the solar system is finite. Uh, our political bodies in a, in a practical sense, we could design them and maintain them in perpetuity as long as we have you know, a, a universe to, to live in. Um, do we, you know, the inevitability, if there's an inevitability, it has to do with the frailty of humanity, our ability, our corruptibility, our inability to, to work towards that common goal of maintaining the society. So in a theoretical world, there's, I, I can think of no reason theoretically why we could not build a sustainable society and a sustainable political system and, and, and have a, a maintain always a cost benefit. Um, we're, we're that creative and, and capable. We, we know what we can do scientifically and intellectually, um, what, what our capacity is. We are able to understand the systemic relationship we have with the planet, the universe, to know the type of damages and the things we can and can't do. Yet here we are in the midst of, of you know, a, a crisis that could end up, you know, potentially in exterminating humanity and with global warming. Um, and the scientists have laid it out pretty clearly what needs to be done, and yet we don't do it. Um, so there was just I just posted an article the other day on Facebook that uh, a couple of regions of the world are now that were inhabitable are now considered too hot to be inhabitable with mm -hmm. the, the ambient temperature, the average temperature there is not sustainable. I think the human body can, can, can manage heat exchange up to 35 degrees. Um, and these are areas where people cannot sustain themselves anymore. So, um, you know, if we do reach that four degrees Celsius threshold, and that's seen as that, the kind of threshold that if the average temperature of the planet gets up that high from the average place it was, we're already up at one to 1.5 degrees, I think. Um, you know, so, you know, at this point it'd be the end of the century that the earth, or and probably sooner, because everything seems to be happening a lot faster than, than the, the, the models tended to be very conservative. Scientists didn't want to be over reactionary. And, and uh, so they tended to take more conservative models um, and give us more time. Um, I would say by 2050, uh, so was that 30 years? You guys are 20 years old. So when you're my age or a little bit younger than me, um, you may not be living on a very sustainable planet. Sorry, we tried. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is why, you know, for me, I see education as, as super important. You know, a lot of people like when you're living in a society, you pretend it can't collapse. You pretend that tomorrow is the same as yesterday. And the, the virus has been good for us in the sense that I think it's kind of made people stop and think is like, you know what, maybe tomorrow won't be like today, that, that things can happen that can completely change the world. Um, certainly it happens to people living in Yemen or Syria or, or parts of Africa um, when they get enmeshed in, in war. Um, but uh, a lot of us tend to feel fairly secure in our existence and, and, and um, expecting it to, to persist uh, as it has. And that's probably the biggest mistake is that complacency. And not to be alarmist, but I think it's really important to understand the variables that you're, you're facing and how those can completely uproot your chance to be able to pursue life and a satisfying and a happy life, which is really you know, what ultimately your existence comes down to, isn't it? Um, or what you maybe can contribute to other people doing that. So, uh, yeah, there was a, a, I know I went off quite a bit on that as I tend to with uh, Asya. Um, who's asking that? Me, me, me ask. Okay, sorry. So it's possible because you know oh, it looks like that we will always suffer and something like that. 
Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you know, Sorry. It's kind of optimistic. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's important to realize theoretically, and, and the reason we study and we look at theory, right, why we, why we understand ecology, why we do all this, the whole purpose of evolving science really is to help us anticipate the future so that we can we can survive it better. So we have the scientific knowledge, we have the theoretical models, we have the theoretical philosophy, right? Um, the basic fundamentals of, re of every religion are about taking care of each other. So, so we have all the all the pieces to make a sustainable, you know, uh, benevolent world. Um, but we we never have ever come close so far in the history of humanity, right? In ten thousand years of, of complex societies and civilization, um, you know, nothing's lasted you know, that long, we looked at that chart of different civilizations um, and and they've always been full of turmoil and, and difficulties. So, the you know, the question is, can we strive, are we striving to to build that utopian concept, right? Like, like Marx saw a utopian and he saw it, it rooted in, in the economics of um, you know material and social relations, can we do that? And and one of the problems I have with modern politicians is that most of them have no vision beyond where we are right now. Um, I liked Obama because he he did have a vision and and he expressed it. And you see it with some of some of the Western leaders. Um, I think Trudeau has a little bit. Um, Macron, I don't see it with with Boris Johnson. Um, Merkel, Andrea Merkel, I think has it. Um, most seem to, to, to what, well, you have to live in your pragmatic world and deal with all the, the stresses and everything within your international relations and internal relations and, and, and the, your, your material economics. You have to, have to also, I think, have an ideal that you're moving towards on, on how to make the world a better place. Um, and so you can't, if your political philosophy is isolationism, you know, uh, you know, as in Lutwak's terms for Rome, scientific hard borders that are going to isolate you from everybody else, um, and that it's every country for themselves. Um, then you're you're doing the opposite, right? You're you're moving more towards that chaotic, entropic design of the world, uh, rather than looking at the world as as a as a unified body, which is what Wallerstein's world systems theory was really. That has a direction to it. That, that, that we build towards a world system like, like the Marxian ideal, um, that we we have everything interconnected. If your political leaders don't have that at least as as a you know a goal for some time in a hundred years or a thousand years, and that that they see that their role as a leader of the country is to move it, you know, a, a little bit closer to that goal, then then you'll never achieve that goal, and and probably barrier that yet your society will will eventually collapse. Other thoughts on that? It's pretty deep stuff, isn't it? Okay, so when I'll build uh, Russia 2.0, I'll be <laughs> I'll have uh, <laughs> some goal. I hope so. I hope that if you if you gain nothing else from this class, I hope you at least recognize that societies will fail. Um, and that if they don't move towards sustainable and, and a more unified, um, you know, objective for, for, you know, for constructing the world, that we will constantly be faced with these stresses that will eventually tear us down. Um, so just a, a kind of a summary on, this, on, on issues associated with collapse from Tainter. Um, just that he sees that society's woes are caused by this decline in returns for your investment um, and the problem solving that goes into that. And when we get to Jared Diamond, uh, hopefully today, if not, we'll, we'll talk about Jared Diamond on Tuesday. Um, his is all about that decision making process. Um, so there are theories associated with um, 
dealing with these problems, this, this cost-benefit analysis uh, that focus on technological innovations. What do you think about that? Is that something that offers a solution? Does that change the equation when you think of cost-benefit analysis? So we were talking about population um, before, and um, we talked about Malthus, right, at the beginning of the, the term. Sometimes I forget what I talked about in one class versus another class. Um, you know, that sort of Malthusian dilemma, you know, you, if you're not there, then you've had it in other classes as well, right, where the population is growing faster than your food production. So why hasn't it really come to pass in a global sense or in a very large scale sense that we've outstripped our ability to produce and we have to, to die off to, to drop down to the amount of food that can be produced? We've increased our technology, right? Fundamental to the development of complex society was, was technological innovations that allowed for intensification of food production. So we <clears throat> take a drink here. So we had intensive agriculture develop. <clears throat> and that allowed us to, to expand our, our population, right? It allowed us to, to build more surplus. Um, in the end of the 19th century, right, again, population was pressure in Europe was, was pushing towards famine. Um, you know, the, it was hard and, and very cost inefficient to get enough fertilizer to, to support the agriculture. Uh, so um, there was a technological innovation on how to extract nitrogen from the air, right, which meant that fertilizer could be very cheap, and and that you know supported the agricultural intensification and revolution that that upped the level of population that could be sustained in in Europe. Um, also, up the you know or decreased the cost in building weapons and armaments that helped fed well, feed World War One as well, right? So because the nitrogen is good for fertilizer, but it's also important to gunpowder. So. Um, but it was a technological solution, right? All our genetic engineering now is is offering us much increased production uh, intensification for agriculture and meat. Um, and, and we're entering a new phase, you know, as, as we begin to grow meat in the laboratory, right? You'll have farms that don't involve, you know, animals with brains that will just be growing the muscle tissue for consumption. Have you seen that, anybody? Anyone tasted any? artificially grown cloned meat. It, it's on the market already in some places, I believe. So, um, you know, that's gonna change things too. I don't know what that'll do if you're a vegetarian because you don't wanna kill animals if you don't have to kill the animals because you're just eating the grown meat. How that, does, how that goes philosophically. Um, so yeah, so technological breakthroughs. You know, I think there are some people who look at climate change going on now and and figure well the scientists have the solution they'll, they'll just you know when when the time comes when we're at, right at that threshold of crisis that they'll just they'll, they'll throw out their technological solution and everything will be better right most of our disaster movies you know about global disasters invasions from aliens and things like that um if they have a solution a good solution then it you know comes from some sort of scientific you know innovation on, on how to defeat you know um, the problem. So, um, yeah. So, so that's that's one of the the considerations there. But there still has to be decision making there, and and you can't count. There there are limitations uh, to what the technology is going to be able to do for you in certain circumstances, and it may not be adequate to deal with the problem, right? And and certainly, you know, lots of times there have been you know, attempts to, to do resolutions that, that just haven't failed, or, you know. Um, and we'll talk about some of those actually when, when we get to the Maya, for instance. And sometimes those, those technologies bring their own problems, such as nuclear energy, right? As Russia knows better than anybody in the world. 
the potentials on that. Um, so, uh, what are some criticisms of Tainter? Um, let me call on, switch pages here. Uh, Andre, do you want to take the, just the first one, first bullet point? Yes, I can. Um, it's very hard to prove or confirm or even falsify a theory of collapse. We can't run controlled experimental tests. Seem reasonable? <laughs> Where am I? No, we can build <laughs> models. Right, but but models have a, you know you you're always reducing the number of variables associated with the model, and it's you know depends on the robustness and strength of your model. Um, you know that's what's kind of interesting about the time we're in now is that because we're seeing such dramatic and powerful variables affecting society, that we can see some of these dynamics in in play. Um, and we have archaeology, you know, which is when we build our models from real data, archaeology and, and, and ancient history, um, that we we can build them with with a pretty good body of knowledge. So, so yeah, it's hard, you know, especially when you're talking in, in the most general terms, like Tainter does. Um, it, it can be hard to prove and it's very easy to take that data that you do have and fit it to what you what your model is right that's always the danger uh, particularly in the social sciences is to is to push everything into into what you expect it to be um, so so there's some truth to that but there are there are ways around it and and I think um, that we, you know, well, no model is perfect, no theory is perfect. Um, it advances our understanding of the dynamics. Uh, second point, uh, who haven't I called on? Ilya, did I call on you? No. Uh, well, okay, I should read it. Uh, the second point. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, well, there are archaeologists and historians who doubt the very idea of societal collapse. Okay, so that's a fair point too, right? And we talked about that a little bit before, is that what is collapse? It can be different things in different times and different societies and, and to different degrees. Um, you know, was the Great Depression a collapse? You know, uh, is, are, are we in a collapse right now? Could that be a, a collapse that's going to feed into uh, a, uh, you know, a, a depression and, and maybe some governments falling apart? Uh, Sonia, do you have a hand up? Yeah, I was Im impressed that, for example, we choose as collapsed society, Joe's uh, China's uh, part and after Joe's dynasty there was another one and it was really a surprise for me that uh, we consider this society as collapsed because for example in Russian history we never think about a uh, fall of uh, one dynasty as collapse and they just change each other and it is like never been watched at this point of view? It depends on theory, because, well, Marxists, uh, I'd say that they may claim that uh, Rurik's dynasty fall is the collapse, but I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember actually Marxist theory here, but... Yeah, of course, I just, uh, I'm just talking about like a usual perception from uh, books or in school and so on. Yeah, um, you know, I, I didn't put a slide on it, but I was going to. Uh, and, and Tainter talks about or, or lists off, you know, what he means by collapse. And uh, maybe I'll throw that slide in for for um, next week. Uh, but but it's you know one thing is you know at the most dramatic aspects like like remember the video we saw yesterday or uh, Tuesday where the the guy from the, the think tank was talking about the you know uh, very specific dark ages that occurred 
And, and what were some of the things that, that, that happened in these dark ages? Breakdown of socio-political complexity, right? So breaking down into smaller organizations, loss of the state identities, um, you know, uh, loss of cultural aspects, loss of record keeping of, of bureaucracies, breakdown of economic systems and trade, uh, you know, trade routes and communication routes. So, I mean, there are, there are real examples of, of, of big collapse, you know, we oftentimes refer to as the dark ages. So when, when uh, Eric talks about the collapse of the Bronze Age, um, that period, you know, um, you know, that archaic period in, in Greek history, uh, you know, will be compared in some ways to one of these dark ages, right? Where not as much is happening culturally, at least we don't have much record of it because there wasn't a really good writing system, right? So here, if you look at Mesopotamia, you know, for 2000 years, we have millions of documents written mostly on clay or in Egypt on papyrus, um, some on, on some other substances, but those are the main things that people wrote records on. Uh, and then you get to this period, you know, starting about the 12th century, and then you go down to about the 8th century, and, and, and we have a lot less for that period. And then it starts to pick up again with Greek cultures as you head, 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 head into classical Greece. Um, and then it builds through the Roman Empire and, and onward. But then when the Roman Empire falls, right, and we head towards the Dark Ages in Europe, again, we don't have that many written records. We have more written records, you know, from Rome than we, we do from, you know, probably Dark Ages Germany or France. Um, and then as we enter into the Middle Ages, again, education starts to pick up. We have the beginnings of the development of university systems. Um, the, you know, uh, the, eventually you move into the Reformation and the Bible becomes translated into other languages and more people are then reading and then you have a printing press and, and, it, and it builds from there. But you have these periods of decline um, that happen. If you look at, you know, I work in Egypt and during the colonial period, as you, as you come out of the uh, 19th century and through the, the kind of war years and the first half of the 20th century, Egypt culturally had, they were producing their own automobiles. They had a, a thriving cinema um, industry. They had arts and culture. Um, places like Alexandria were world centers for trade and business and espionage and all sorts of things. Um, and then you had the, the post-colonial period and, and things went to decline culturally. And now, now they're building all those things up again. Um, with the civilization. So there, there are ebbs and flows that can be measured in different ways, but there, but there are clearly periods of collapse and then there are periods of these reductions of some characteristics of civilization and complex society that, that, that are part of a, a process, but not a, it may not be a, what you consider a complete collapse of, of a society. Should we consider the, the transference from the USSR to the you know, Russian Federation, a, a collapse of the USSR? I, ideologically, I, I think it is. Um, you know, how much actually really changed, you know, as you move from one to the other? I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it, um, but certainly there were ideological changes, governmental changes, structural changes, um, economic changes for better or worse. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think when we think about collapse, because we're looking at some of the same dynamics, but they may manifest differently depending on the time, circumstances, and, and the severity of the collapse. Um, but I think it's still worth looking at. When you look at what happens in Shao, uh, China, Sonia, um, when, when you have the collapse of the Shao, what happens? Well, there is too much reason, and it's, it's difficult to summarize. What does China look like politically after that? Is it, is it a large centralized state, or is it breakdown into smaller warring states? A uh, smaller state, I think. There is a yeah. lot of uh, theories. Was uh, Zhou Dynasty centralized or not? But it seems like it's, it, it was... Um, there is a lot of little 
uh, I don't know, little societies inside this society. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an early state. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what you guys come up with on that, that research on that. And that may, oftentimes you see that if you never quite are able to bring together everybody. So as a, you know, we talked about pure polity competition, right? Where you have a bunch of smaller states or city states competing with each other. And then they tend to absorb each other. Like we look at the expansion of Rome in Italy and then, you know, and beyond. Um, those, those, those federated states can be a weakness in the system. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the Aztec Empire. I think it's a good example. Or, or when you look at the hegemonic model that Lutwak talks about, where you have these people that still have a lot of independence, you can see that there's a lot of freedom for them to break away from the empire at that point, right? To break, you know, you, your hold, you know, the, the forces, those, those, uh, centripetal forces holding the entity together as a, as a single political entity are a little bit tenuous when you're looking at strong federated states that have a lot of independence, have their own political leaders and their own factions, uh, their own developed economy. Um, and it's a lot easier for them when something happens to just say, heck with it, we're not, we're not part of you anymore. Um, and so you can have those structures break down um, and maybe, and, and again, I don't know enough about the show right now. It's been a long time since, you know, decades since I've read about them. So um, I look forward to, to working with you guys and seeing what you guys come up with on that. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of debate about what is collapse. And, and here uh, we're taking a very broad definition. We're not looking at just those instances where something completely is obliterated and lost from history, you know, the kind of Atlantis sort of collapse. Um, we're looking at these processes where there's major institutional changes, where things stop functioning as they did, and, and there has to be some sort of reformation or a period of, of hiatus of, of a dark age where things stop being produced and then they, they come back together. Uh, I thought I just saw a flash of lightning, so if I lose power or something, forgive me on that. Yeah, no, I just heard it. So, um, so uh, how about number three, Anna Trevina? You want to read that? The third point, Anna, uh, Alessia. Did you read the third bullet? Yeah, of course. A uh, certain, certain closeness to each of the concepts Tainer uses to support his theory, and that makes it a bit too easy to message uh, historical data to fit the theoretical parameters. Yeah, so that's what we talked about before, right? So this, this fuzziness of, of this type of data and, and that it's easy to, to take your data and kind of push it around and, um, you know, uh, as they say, massage it to, to make it come out the way it has to, right? The way it has to, according to your theoretical precept. So, um, you know, I, I'm forced to do that with your grades, for instance, right? At the, at the end of the term, I have to adjust them to the point so that seven is the medium grade. Um, and um, usually I don't have much choice on that. So uh, I may think that everyone deserves an eight or a nine, but you know, I, I have this theoretical precept that no, everyone has to be a seven. And so I have to try and, and massage the data in a fair way to, to bring it down to that average. <laughs> Scientists do that all the time, you know, uh, unconsciously, right, with their data to, or sometimes consciously, you know, to, to make it fit the theoretical parameters. Uh, we'll see how good your, your internet infrastructure is here in uh, Tumen. Uh, with the storm going. Uh, and number four, how about Tatiana? Me? Yeah, you want to read the last point, the bullet point? Mm -hmm. The core idea that collapse arises from a rapid and um, substantial decline in social political complexity. But what is a rapid and substantial decline? Yeah. So, and again, that's a, you know, we're saying that we're taking a very broad approach, but when you think of that bell curve, it's, it's how steep is that 
is that on the on the rear end there, right on the right side? How fast is that dropping down? Um, and and that's kind of your measure, your your visualization of how steep your collapse is. If you look at American Gross National Product as we enter into February and then go into March, right? It's it's going to look pretty dramatic uh, as far as our production. And if you look at our national debt, it's going to look pretty dramatic on a, on a very steep decline. Now, how prolonged that is, so time is a factor in that too. Um, you know, is it able to rebound very quickly? And, and that'll be the measure, you know, as I said, this could be, you know, in, you know, in 10 years, the historians might be looking at this and going, yeah, look at this. I can just plot the collapse of the United States right here on a graph. I can see the steep drop in all these, these measures that I'm using, these metrics that talk about the cost benefit relationship. And, and, you know, and this is right. Here's the point I can, you know, I can plot it here because it's so dramatic. A uh, hand came up. Did I see one? Somebody? No? Yeah, yeah, it was me. I just want to say that, for example, in Russian history, we have this rapid and essential changes. For example, at the time when Peter the first like changed our society, but maybe the key, uh, the important that these changes was like predictable, and we can look at uh, this from from that uh, criteria. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know Russian history that well, but Peter the Great was a time of expansion and solidification of the state, wasn't it? So the kind of a growth, it was, it was a change of the state, but a positive where the, where the benefits were, were high, that there was good returns for the cost invested. The Russian Revolution, on the other hand, that's a dramatic change, right, from, you know, where you had a complete change of government, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people dying, um, you know, yes. also international. So is it necessary that collapse means negative changes? Yeah, that, that, that's one thing we can say, that collapse is, is the bad thing. Right? Maybe for, for some time, but then it can be like better oh. society. Sure, absolutely. You know, um, your house can burn down and you can build a beautiful new house there, right? Or, you know, you are you might have a very bad year of crops in your field, but all the, you know, all the dead crops that never, you know, made it to, to harvest might then fertilize that field and the field becomes, becomes better. Um, there, there's always the opportunity and humans can be quite good at it, you know, there's a lot of things, memes going around or on the internet right now that that after the coronavirus, that the world won't be the same and we shouldn't let it be the same, right? So that we take this opportunity, this decline, and we use it to to provide the impetus, you know, ideologically, intellectually, um, by having the example that we learned of history, you know, in America, how many, you know, 30 million people pushed into unemployment, you know, with loss of jobs, that we say, you know what, having a system where one month of a virus and, and being locked up forces 30 million people to lose their jobs, maybe that's not a good system. Maybe we need to change that system. Um, so there's a lot of optimism about being able to rebuild a better country you know, but again, you need to be able to get the political leadership in, in power to who, who has that same philosophy. And so there has to be enough of a public um, force, you know, a, a manifestation of social power from the from the public to push the political institutions to, to follow that philosophy. Yeah, so so good things can come from bad, right? You know, it happens in our lives too, right, at a very individual level. You know, you, you as they say, sometimes you get lemons in life, and you you know, if you're good, you can make lemonade out of them, right? So, other questions, comments? Um, how are we on time? Okay, we got a little bit. So let's let's start talking a little bit about Mexico, ancient Mexico during the time of the Aztec Empire. So here, what you see is is 
a mosaic of the different types of kingdoms that are existing in Mexico in, the, in the, what's called the, the post-classic period. It's the, the period just before the Spanish arrived. Um, and of course, in the center where Mexico City is, over here, can you see my pointer when I wiggle it around there? Okay, good. Um, that, you know, that was the home of the Aztec Empire. So in this map, you can see the provinces that were incorporated into the Aztec Empire. So the Aztec Empire, again, is right here is Tenochtitlan. So that's the capital of the Aztec Empire. And all these other provinces at various times, even all the way down here, um, were incorporated into the empire. There are a few areas that weren't. There's another empire here called the Tarascan Empire, uh, a kingdom of Tlaxcala over here, who the Aztecs never conquered. Um, they were constantly at war with, but it seemed to be like a, uh, um, an accepted war that they would fight a, a, um, a war that was kind of limited and um, sometimes called a flowery war uh, to, to take captives, but it, it tended to be a display of force and, and trying to keep each other in check and make sure that they weren't a threat to each other. But uh, the Aztecs had clearly surrounded Tlaxcala and, and were the, the dominant empire here. Tlaxcala, of course, became the ally of the Spanish when the Spanish arrived, and that was one of the problems that the Aztecs faced, and we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of weeks. So you can see that they've got quite a spread out empire here uh, to try and maintain. So what are the mechanisms for controlling this empire. If you look at the core of the empire, that's pretty pretty self-explanatory. What, what do you see here? If this is the capital city right here, Tenochtitlan. What are your observations about it? And this is this is the Valley of Mexico here, so Tenochtitlan's over here. Um, and then these other dots over all around are different city states around the Valley of Mexico that were incorporated into the Aztec Empire eventually. Uh, it was, it was, it, it politically it was tentatively three city states had formed an alliance called the Triple Alliance. Um, but by the end, the Mexica city state, the, the Tenochtitlan, the Aztec one, the Azteca, they became the dominant of the three, and the others were became subservient to them within the, the Triple Alliance. But uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Triple Alliance uh, Aztec Empire. So, um, what are your observations about this? What do you think are some of the logistical um, issues or, or positives that they they faced? So obviously, we see that uh, this city. Uh, it's got it uh, with uh, uh, some water, so it's like protected by water, but it also connected uh, with the uh, continent with some bridges, like and they like you know like s s some s some kind of uh, some kind of lines that connects everything. Yeah. So, you know, just like, you, uh, you know, obviously much smaller than the Mediterranean Sea, but we talk about the position that Rome was in, in having these, this water transport. So here are your basic transport to all, everywhere around the, the um, Lake Texcoco in the Valley of Mexico and all the other little lakes here, um, meant that, that they had a lot of canoe transport, right? So within the Valley of Mexico, at the very least, transport was very efficient. Right. And then, of course, they as they built, you know, engineering wise, they built all these causeways, they built aqueducts to bring fresh water into the city. Uh, so so they were able to build that infrastructure. So transport, at least within the Valley of Mexico, was quite efficient. Uh, and they were in a good place. Right. When they originally settled here, they were refugees. And they were, you know, stuck in a swamp in the middle of the lake, and that's that's what that was their lot. Um, and they, you know, turned it into as, as servants and warriors for the previous kingdom that was there. They then managed to eventually take over and and become the dominant city state within the region. 
Um, so yeah, so the, the big thing there is, is that water transport. The other thing, of course, that you need to be able to sustain an empire, and particularly in the core of the empire here, is what? Like the hydraulic hypothesis of Wittfogel? How about intensive agriculture? To be able to produce enough food, enough surplus there. It, one of the, the big innovations that the Aztecs had was development of a wetland agriculture system called Chinapas. And it was, um, some people refer to it as floating gardens. Uh, there's not much of it left. The lakes are largely drained, right? Because Mexico City occupies most of that, those wetlands now. Um, that's why part of Mexico City sinks all the time. Um, there's a small part left uh, in a part of the city called Xochicalco, uh, Xochimilco. Uh, Xochi just means flower. And, and, um, and that's what they do is they grow flowers there now. Uh, but in ancient times, in the time of the Aztecs, you see that they, they developed this very rich, highly productive system. You can see here's an ancient map, you know, showing the land allotments with the different Chinampas plots where they could grow, they would use little seed plots, uh, plants to plant and, and grow them to uh, bigger and then spread them out and replant them. Um, they used human feces for fertilizer. Uh, they also developed um, the kind of sludge that would, would grow in the canals that they would use also as fertilizer. It was very rich. Uh, and so it was an extremely highly productive, highly dependable system for production. And of course, transport of your, your goods was very easy also because you had your canoes right there and it was all canaled already. Um, so you can see that these were just built by driving stakes into the ground and then filling in with earth, you know, shovel the earth out. Uh, so you're able to take the swampy land and turn it into extremely productive agricultural land. And that was really one of the heart land, you know, the, the, the strongest points of the Aztec economic system was that they had this very, uh, lucrative, highly productive system of, of agriculture in place. Questions? So, having an empire, why do you why do you conquer these other provinces? A couple of different motives. What are some of the motives why you conquer other provinces that we've talked about? Resources. All right. A big one was resources, and they and they became really greedy about their resources and, and very efficient and, and bureaucratic about it as well. Um, so we'll talk about resources most, but let's also mention defense, right? If you conquer them, they can't conquer you, right? Uh, and so, so you'll see the ideology, the human sacrifice, for instance, um, was, was very much tied into this imperial ideology. Uh, at one point, after there was a transition, right? Because a lot of times the 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 um, tribute states would rebel when the king died, right? Because they see that as a time of weakness, and so the new king would come in and then run around and conquer everybody again and extract tribute, but also take prisoners uh, back for sacrifice, and that and those prisoners were meant to send a message, you know, was, yes, it was feeding the sun god, Huitzilopochtli, right? And, and you needed the beating hearts ripped out of your chest, right? And then your body was turned down and fed to animals or eaten in cannibalistic rituals. Um, but it, it was a clear political message as well. And one of the biggest sacrifices on the, the, the temple was, um, you know, 20, supposedly 20,000 people sacrificed in, in uh, I don't know if it was all done in one day, but the priests had become quite proficient at it. They, it was quite a specialty for a priest to be able to split your sternum with an obsidian knife, pull it open, cut the beating heart out, and, and hold the beating heart up, you know, for uh, as an offering to the sun god. Um, and they were they were very efficient at it. So it, it's important, I think, to see how all these different factors work together, right? The religion, the politics, the economics. Are, are all intertwined. So here we're looking at the Codex Mendoza, and this is a tribute, mostly a tribute codex. It's got other political organizational aspects of, of it as well. But these pages here, uh, over here, are tributary pages. And so you can see things like um, uh, warrior uniforms made of feathers, 
shields, greenstone beads, um, some specialized crops, uh, cacao, um, you know, uh, uh, chocolate, <laughs> right? Um, value products that are brought in and that uh, the, the names of the towns who have to pay the tribute are all listed along here. This is the town where I did most of my work and this is called Ostuma. Um, it's the cave of the hand. You can see there's a hand coming out of the cave monster's mouth. Um, so, so this list the towns and these are the tribute items that the towns are responsible for paying on um, uh, several times a year to Tenochtitlan. Uh, again, here's more tribute, cotton, um, uh, gold was common. The, you, the gold would usually be, they take a bird feather and fill it up with the powdered gold. Uh, and then here are some of the conquest history, just showing when you conquer a town or you, you burn the temple and it's shown in the, the glyphic sense here. And then some of the organizational, there was a uh, calendrix here, and then organizationals with the names of kings, you know, speaking, um, showing authority, different bureaucratic officers like governors who were established out in the provinces to, to maintain um, power, uh, these type of things would be documented in these in these codex, right? Um, a lot of these were recreated during the, the Spanish time or modified in the Spanish time, so you see that there's Spanish uh, um, letters written with the Aztec language on it. The Aztecs didn't have a, a you know, use those type of letters, they used the glyphic language. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't a formal language like, say, Maya language, where each glyph has a, a sound to it, or, or hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics. These glyphs were ones that, that could spell out the names of places, and uh, but were done in a pictographic way also that would tell, you know, such as a, a line saying, you know, who did what at what date, or who was connected by, to which town. Um, so things like that, that were carried within these, you know, elaborate codices. So how does that tribute get to the capital then? Right, in the Valley of Mexico, easy, right? You're, you're all within, you know, uh, either a canoe or a day's walk. Um, they, they had a very elaborate system. One of the things, one of the professions that developed with the Aztec Empire were, were uh, a group of merchants called the Pochteca, um, or Pochtecayot is the, the plural. So these were people who were professional merchants who could carry, um, using a tump line, right, to strap it to the head and carry a backpack, because there were no pack animals in Mexico. So everything was transported either by foot or by canoe. And so they had developed these this special class. Um, when we talk about stratification and specialization, this was one of the professions and there were different types of merchants. So you notice that this one's carrying an obsidian bladed spear. Um, they were also warriors. Um, if you remember when I showed that first map of, of the Aztec Empire, there was one colony way down towards Guatemala. Let me go back a couple of this to show you. So down here, Xoconusco, uh, this was a case where the merchants who would travel far and wide, some went all the way up to the United States, some uh, had come down here involved in, in exchange. Uh, they ended up getting into an uh, argument with the, the, the people there and, and the merchants ended up conquering the kingdom there themselves. And by the time the Aztec army came to, to help them, they had already taken control of this province and, it, and then became part of the Aztec empire. Um, even though it was so detached with a lot of other kingdoms in between. Um, so it just gives you an idea how well developed these merchants were. They were aligned in, in clans, uh, family units, but, but they would be specific professionals. So it would be people brought in from different clans, working together, trained, um, and with very, you know, almost like union-like rules. They could carry 23 kilograms, for instance, is what you're allowed to carry. So now you imagine the size of that empire with that tribute that's coming in from all these different provinces, right? That has to be, if you don't pay your tribute, then you'd be subject to being attacked, right? The army will 
when the when, after the agricultural season, the army will go and campaign again and, and go and make sure that everybody's staying in line with belonging to the empire. So is this a territorial or hegemonic empire largely from what we've described? Hegemonic, because they're client states, client tribes. Right, and they're using a mobile army that would then enforce it, right? So it's this threat of force. It's the, having the power and the threat rather than they, they had to use it uh, you know, quite a bit, um, but yeah, it, it, and but but you also see circumstances like that that province I told you I was working on, and we'll talk about it later. Ostuma, there was an Aztec garrison there and a fortification and a, and a chain of fortification. So you see that this, it wasn't just a solid or a single strategic theory. And this was like we were saying one of the criticisms of Lutwek was is that he tended to try and say. In this period, in the julio claudian period, we're, we're hegemonic, and then in the you know Severian, Severian period, we're scientific frontiers. Um, but as the critique goes there and applies to the Aztec Empire, it's very circumstantial to what's going on in a particular frontier, what the dynamics are, who the people they're conquering, who the people, the enemies that they're facing, all these things that go into it. What are the resources that they want to extract from there? How valuable is it? How much do you want to invest? What's your cost benefit analysis then to maintaining those frontiers? And I think we will stop it there. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, but otherwise I wish you guys a good night and I guess no one's going out tonight in the rainstorm. So, all right, thank you. Appreciate your thank time. You. Thank you, bye. Thank bye. you.